Thanks so much. So as everyone, I think, uh, realizes at this time, the real truth about health is that it's out of date. Uh, and this old idea of prescriptive bad medicine, which is what I was taught in medical school back in the 70s, uh, is no longer applicable and no longer helpful for these very complex illnesses. And as we were just hearing, uh, things like uh, you know, things like mercury, huge issue. And we really need to look at these and look at organism, organismal health. So let me uh, share some slides here uh, and go through a couple of things and talk a little bit about what we've been doing with our latest trial. And let me share that. Okay. And let's pull this up. Here we go. There we go. Okay. So the whole idea of network medicine is that we need to quit thinking about human beings as being simple, come in for seven minutes and you get a prescription that has absolutely nothing to do with what's causing the problem. A hundred years ago, of course, uh, most people were dying from simple illnesses, things like pneumococcal pneumonia. And on the other hand, today, virtually all of us are dying from complex chronic illnesses. And I see there are about almost 200 people uh, here. So that means about 30 of us here today uh, will die of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and the challenge today is, let's see if we can make that zero. Let me show you how this disease works. Let's look under the hood. We spent 30 years, published over 220 peer-reviewed papers on understanding what actually drives cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease so that we could fashion the first effective treatments. And we've had unprecedented success in preventing and reversing cognitive decline. And as you might imagine, the sooner you start, the better off, the easier it is, and the more complete uh, return that you get. Okay, so let's, there we go. All right, so I wanna just mention before we get started here, the semantics of success, because a lot of us have heard about a successful drug and there's been a lot of, uh, there've been a lot of argument, a lot of controversy. And as you may have heard, when the FDA approved this drug right here, which is called aducanumab, which was back in June, um, three of the expert panel members, well, there are 11 expert panel members, all of them uh, were not enthusiastic. In fact, all of them said, do not approve this. The FDA decided to approve it anyway. And we could understand to some extent they were saying, well, hey, we haven't had anything in many years. Maybe this is something. The problem, as you can see here, is that the very best this drug did was not to make people better. It was not to stabilize cognitive decline. But in fact, it was in one trial at one dose only to slow the decline here by 22%. So you can see if you have Alzheimer's or pre-Alzheimer's, MCI, which is mild cognitive impairment, then on average, you lose about three and a half points on a 30 point scale, MOCA, MMSE, things like that. You lose about three and a half points per year. With aducanumab, again, one trial failed completely. Another trial failed on certain doses, but on one dose, it improved by 22%. It just slowed the decline. Now, in contrast, the trial that I'll show you today, and it's now been accepted for publication, it's already uh, online so that you can see the preprint on MedArchive already. We actually saw people improve their performance. And as I'll show you, people who improve their performance sustain their improvement. And this is because we're not trying to treat this as a simple illness and give one prescription the same thing for everybody. We're flipping the script and we're saying, what are the things that actually contributed in each of these people? And then we are attacking those things. All right, so I wanna show you a specific example. So here's a 68-year-old woman, one of the many people who's come, and we have thousands of people now who have been on this protocol. Uh, as was mentioned earlier, uh, we had uh, the first 10 uh, came out in 2014. We published another 10 in 2016, and then we published 100 in 2018, and then we published our, our trial uh, last year, and we're now starting a larger trial. So this woman actually started um, with paraphasic errors. So she was saying the wrong thing. She was saying the wrong words. Um, and of course, we've just all heard that Bruce Willis uh, has aphasia. So she presented in somewhat similar fashion. 
Um, and then she had depression as well, which again is relatively common in people who have a specific subtype of Alzheimer's that I'll talk about in just a moment, which in this case turns out to be the toxic type. So as many people do, she struggled with her computer work. She couldn't, she couldn't finish a gingerbread man that she had done many times before. She had trouble with clock hands, and that's a relatively common problem. It typically means that you have parietal lobe dysfunction. And then finally, she started having memory problems, forgot to pick up her granddaughters, which really worried her. And so she actually had what we would call a non-amnestic presentation. About two thirds of people, as they are developing Alzheimer's, have an amnestic presentation. So they struggle with memory. But about a third of them, including this woman, will have a non-amnestic presentation. Problems with executive function with organizing things, problem with uh, things like recognizing clock hands, recognizing shapes, calculation problems, word finding problems, all of these sorts of things. She then had an amyloid PET scan. So she went in for a classical evaluation, had an amyloid PET scan that was positive, indicating that she was on her way to developing Alzheimer's disease. She was ApoE4 positive, so she had the most common risk factor for Alzheimer's. And we'll get into why this is such an important risk factor. So if you look at the United States as a whole, then about three quarters of us are ApoE4 negative. And so that means that we have about a 9% chance during our lifetime. Now it's not zero, but it's not terribly high. If you have a single copy, which is what this woman had, that's 75 million Americans, and the vast majority of them don't know it. Their risk is about 30% during their lifetime. And if you have two copies, so in other words, one from your mother and one from your father, then your risk is substantially higher, well over 50%, and that's 7 million Americans. So the reality is we should all know our APOE status, and yet... The Alzheimer's Association says, no, don't bother to check this because there's nothing you can do about it. As I'll show you, nothing could be further from the truth. Now, her MOCA score, perfect score is 30. And hers was already, if you drop below 28, you're already beginning to show mild cognitive impairment. If you're down and below 22, you have full-on Alzheimer's disease. Hers was 24. So she had quite significant MCI, and she happened to be a highly intelligent uh, professor. So she was likely to be falling relatively late in her uh, overall uh, time, her overall uh, process. Her hippocampal volume was already down to the 14th percentile and many people who are developing Alzheimer's or who have Alzheimer's will have a reduced hippocampal volume. So you actually get shrinkage in that part of your brain, which is critical for memory. So as I say, her diagnosis was mild cognitive impairment. And it's unfortunate that the term mild is used. It's a little bit like saying to someone, don't worry, you only have mildly metastatic cancer because it's a relatively late stage of cognitive decline. So she began on a clinical trial with an anti-amyloid drug, just like the one that I just showed you. And with each injection, she actually got much worse. And this has happened to a number of people and I'll show you why. So after eight treatments, she said, this is not working for me. It's making me worse each time. And then she would kind of slowly fight her way almost back to where she started. Then she'd get ejected again and get worse again. So fortunately, after eight treatments, she left the trial and she ended up um, emailing me. So she and further evaluation failed, failed her uh, visual contrast sensitivity. Her C4A was high, 79.90, shouldn't be over 28.30, as Dr. Shoemaker has taught us. Her TGF beta 1 was high, her MMP9 was high, her urinary mycotoxins were high, a number of them, such as ochratoxin A, for example. Her Marcons was positive. Uh, her HSCRP was a little not off the charts, but again, this is very common with mycotoxin associated illness that you have some degree of inflammation, but your HSCRP isn't off the charts, but hers was slightly high. And then interestingly, many of these people who have mycotoxin associated cognitive decline for reasons that we don't understand yet have very low triglycerides. And this may be partly from malabsorption, her triglycerides very low, 29, and her zinc also low, two things that we often see in people who have mycotoxin associated cognitive decline. 
So she began on the protocol that I'll show you today, which is personalized. So again, we looked at all the different things that are contributing to her, identified those, and almost nobody has one cause of cognitive decline. Most people have a combination. They may have some insulin resistance. They may have some leaky gut. They may have exposure to specific toxins as we've heard about here. They may have other things as well uh, and may have poor, uh, 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 poor dentition with an abnormal oral microbiome. So she was started on a protocol that addressed all these things and included some basics like a plant-rich, mildly ketogenic diet. We call it KetoFlex 12-3, her Marcon's treatment, detoxification, among other things, actually going after what was causing the problem instead of just trying to remove the amyloid, which is actually there as a protectant. It's part of your innate immune system. Her symptoms resolved. She was once again able to speak, cook, shop, tell time, build gingerbread men, no longer forgot to pick up her granddaughters. And that was six years ago. She's now six years into this and still scoring a perfect 30 on her mocha. So her mocha went from 24 up to perfect 30 and it stayed there. Her hippocampal volume improved from the 14th percentile to the 28th percentile. She's remained stable, as I mentioned for six years. So the features that we have to think of when we think of this particular presentation, and I mentioned it first because it's a relatively common one, and it's one that people find in general is the hardest to deal with because you do have to address these various issues. And it's very common for people to have mycotoxin-associated cognitive decline. Mm -hmm.